Before the interview, Donald Trump is saying, yeah. you know, do a good job praising you. And then afterwards at his rally last week saying that you're too nice and you're nasty. You're both. <laughs> the, the Truth Social um, post that he put up before was, uh, was a long, did you see yeah. a long diatribe yes. about how I, I have a, a poten the potential for greatness? Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, Obviously, I failed. Hi, I'm Dean Obidala. Welcome to Salon Talks. Today we're here with Dana Bash. You know her from CNN. She's the chief political correspondent. She's the host of Inside Politics, the co-host of State of the Union, and she's got a brand new book, America's Deadliest Election, the cautionary tale of the most violent election in American history. Nice to see you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate sure, it. Sure. Let, when people hear the title, America's uh -huh. Deadliest Election, their mind, of course, will come to January 6th. That's not at all what the book is about, at least not directly. No. How did tell people about this gubernatorial race in Louisiana? How did you find it, and why is it so compelling to you that you wrote a book, which is really a compelling book? 1872. It is very much not right. 2020 and and 2021 that you're talking about, and that back then was was real violence. Hundreds and hundreds of people died, uh, including an, a massacre mm -hmm. of uh, of black men. And that's really the context in which this election took place. It was during Reconstruction, and the uh, election beforehand uh, was in 68, and newly freed black men, of course it was only men then, were allowed to vote, right. and they did. And they elected people who, as they should, support their point of view and support their rights. And the segregationists, the, raci the racists, saw that and said, whoa, we can't let that happen again. And so that was when they begun to use intimidation, disenfranchisement at the polls, and they were successful in keeping thousands, probably, of, of black men from voting. And so the election was so corrupted, nobody knew who won. Mm -hmm. Therefore, n nobody would concede. So there were two governors, there, there were opposing candidates. Right. Neither would concede, so both were, were inaugurated by their own people. The legislatures, same thing, two legislatures sworn in, uh, two slates of judges, and it was total and complete chaos. And it got to the point where the, the leaders were calling for violence, and that happened. Colfax massacre in Grant Parish, named for Ulysses S. Grant, uh, and there were 150 black men murdered in cold blood because they were trying to uh, protest and protect the right to, or make clear that they didn't have the right to vote and they should have. In order to prosecute that, uh, they realized that these white men probably wouldn't get uh, convicted in a jury of their peers in the state of Louisiana. It went into the federal court. It was tried on the basis of civil rights. And it got all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court decided in a very important, monumentous, uh, decision, Crookshank, that it is up to the states, not the federal government, to determine people's civil rights. And the South said, okay, we agree. And we're going to impose Jim Crow laws for the next 100 years. And that is how we got there. And it all started with this election. It's kind of remarkable. This election was that was the spark to all of that and how that Supreme Court decision, as you go through, laid the basis for Jim Crow laws later through the South. What, a, you know, so just so people can understand the context, because I think it's so important what you're saying. This is in the post-Civil War era. It's Reconstruction. Yeah. Tensions, as you paint in this picture, are very high. There are former Confederate officers, fighters who are living there, and they're seeing black people voting, the people who they had enslaved or they were involved as fighting for slavery. They're slaves, right. yeah, so, exactly. So how much did that contribute to it? And, and the election of 1872, that was the spark that exploded, but it wasn't in a vacuum. It was all of that that was going on. Can you share a little bit about that kind of tinderbox that was there? It was such a tinderbox. And it was, it, it, first of all, it was just the fundamental belief of these people who were white supremacists yeah. uh, that black people shouldn't have those rights. Even if they're not their slaves, they shouldn't have rights. And, um, and then there was the economic aspect of it, which was huge because they suddenly didn't have free labor. And that was a big part of Reconstruction to try to, to, to answer that. Um, and up until then, and this is one of the many parallels between then and now, um, people trusted the electoral system, mm -hmm. by and large. You cast your ballot, 
that was done by hand. It took a very long time. Somebody said, this is who won, and that was it. And that stopped with this election, as it should have, because it was so incredibly uh, corrupted and people who had the right to vote were not allowed to vote. And um, because uh, of this, and this is focused on Louisiana at the beginning of the book, then we fast forward to 1876, the presidential election, where this kind of corruption was true in Louisiana, again, also other states. And the president of the United States could not be determined because four states, including Louisiana, their electoral slates were so messed up. In fact, they sent two electoral mm -hmm. slates to, to Congress. And it was um, the first time that we could find that a vice president had to decide whether or not his job was ceremonial or whether he could have a, an, an impact and really um, decide which slates of electors would be determined. And that vice president, or, or the people around that vice president, this determined that it was only ceremonial. So I don't know about you. Did you know any of this history? I knew the Colfax massacre okay. part. I didn't know anything about the 1872 election. Yeah. I didn't know about the people that you introduced us to in a way. This book, like, you know, so the like, young Republican who's the governor there, who's got a bright future, and exactly. then how it gets darker and darker. And like, because I thought at first, I'm like, oh, this book is about this young guy. Yeah. You, you know, I'm like, oh, this is much darker. <laughs> Very dark. But but I, the reason I asked is, as a reporter, especially somebody covering politics, had I known about this history before we were, never mind the 2020 election and all that happened then, but January 6, 2021, mm -hmm. watching Mike Pence struggle with that question and then decide, just like back then, that it was, in fact, just ceremonial. There were so many parallels in here. The people in the streets of New Orleans screaming, hang him. Mm. Uh, assassination attempts, including one, and this was after the book was already done, uh, that Donald Trump's assassination attempt happened. But if you notice in the book, uh, the gubernatorial candidate, when they tried to kill him, he describes the bullet whizzing by his head and hearing the bullet. It's eerie how many similarities there are. There is another similarity, and you talk about it in your book, the partisan news media yeah. feeding lies yep. about election misinformation. And it, it caused an incitement of violence. Mm -hmm. I mean, and there's no doubt about it. And then, again, that's something that we can't help but see. Mm -hmm. And the idea that you had certain pro-Trump media outlets that later had to pay massive fines or you know, damages because of what they were doing, misinformation, that yeah. those lawsuits continue. Is that, I think, a great point you make and that people don't realize partisan media has been with us and it's probably worse, to be honest, it was in the worse. early days. Yeah. That, but can you share about how partisan media played a role in fueling this? And again, that lesson for us now in 2024? Yeah, and partisan media has been around since, Washington since the Hamilton. press. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so that is true. The, the difference in 1872 is that technology was starting to improve. The telegraph existed. And so there were many more newspapers and, and information could flow more freely and, and faster than, uh, you know, on, on horseback right. <laughs> and, and, via, and via train. So uh, that was a big part of it. And it was big business to have newspapers. I mean, gosh, I, I don't advocate having partisan newspapers in local uh, cities and states, but having more newspapers, can you imagine they had multiple I mean, hundreds of newspapers uh, on the local level, and they were printing out uh, many a day. And the point you're making is really key, is that for the most part, they were mouthpieces mm -hmm. of uh, the parties, of the party leaders, and it was hard for people to find the facts as they were, as opposed to uh, the feedback loop that they were getting from people, I, I, you, you assume, if they believe in the democratic cause and the, the segregationist that you're going to buy those papers. And so that's basically all they were hearing. Um, and it is eerily similar to, to, to today, uh, except that we're all seeing that on our phone with algorithms. So it's 100 times worse. It is. You can just live in your own silo and never see the news of the other side. And, and the partisan press, I mean, it, it does go back. George Washington was yeah. subjected to it. He was even yeah. called of like he was taking bribes from the British. This is the guy who led the our troops against yep. the, uh, in the Revolutionary War, and it got that ugly and that bad so early. And I was just reading 
a book on Washington where that was a big part of it. I'm like, wow, that's stunning. So, you know, in, in the book, you go into great detail about the Colfax massacre. That's not the only, like that gets headlines. It's yeah. horrific. Yeah. It, was a, it was a white supremacist terrorist attack. There's so much other violence that went on at that time. Yeah. It is jaw-dropping. And on the see. streets, I mean, the Colfax right. massacre was not in New Orleans. It was in Grand Parish. There was violence on the streets of New Orleans, pitch battles on the streets of New Orleans. And um, the Battle of Liberty Place, mm -hmm. which, I mean, I, I know that there are um, sort of plaques there to... Uh, to tell people about it, and um, and people in the, like who grow grow up in Louisiana and learn Louisiana history learn a little bit about it, but I don't believe that they learn the fulsome, the whole story about the the real the real violence and the need for federal troops. I mean, that's the other part of the story that um, also led to the South being able to do what it did for a hundred years until the more modern day civil rights uh, movement in the 50s and 60s came about, which is uh, the fact that the, um, the states were left alone uh, to fend for themselves with regard to the troops down there, also as part of the 1876 compromise, which is another crazy story, that they couldn't get uh, agreement on who won the presidency because the electoral college was split thanks to those four states mm -hmm. being thrown out. And they came up with a commission and eventually the president of the United States at that time, it, the winner was Rutherford B. Hayes, was decided by one man. And it was also part of a backroom deal where Hayes, with a wink and a nod, more than a wink and a nod, was like, okay, um, I'll take it, but it was very clear the implication is that he would have to pull federal troops out of the South. So any chance at keeping the peace and keeping uh, uh, black people safe with federal troops, with Grant, which Grant tried to do on and off throughout uh, the 18, early 1870s, that was over as well. The, the only, I didn't know about the gubernatorial fight. The only reason I knew a little bit about Rutherford Hayes and that commission is because Ted Cruz had wanted a commission like that yes, after the 2020 did. election and called for it and specifically said that election. That's right. And the Electoral Count Act, which then set January 6th as a date for what happened, That's right. happened after that disputed election. Yep. Where they're like, okay, this, even, they're like, doesn't matter who benefited, we got to stop this. Uh -huh. And that's why they amended it recently. So you also talk about the rise of the white leagues yeah. there. Can you touch on them? And, and to me, I think our history is filled with times where if white supremacy is challenged in, in terms of power, Violence becomes one of the tools in their arsenal. They might try to do voter suppression, that kind of stuff, but the white leagues, and do you see any similarities today to some of the far-right movements in the U.S.? Sure. I mean, they still live on. And the white leagues, um, I mean, one of the groups was called the White League, but the KKK was born in this time, not in Louisiana and Tennessee, but still, you know, offshoots of it uh, certainly spread all over the South. And white supremacists were a, an outgrowth of Confederates, of slave owners. I mean, they're all, not all of them, some of them reformed. I don't want to say that they haven't, but um, this is all about not just wanting free labor, but genuinely believing in a disgusting way that people who are not white are lesser than. Mm -hmm. And they believe that it is their right to do whatever they need to do, including kill uh, and suppress in order to keep that way of life. And it, the reason is because if they see a black man or woman as lesser than, then they don't think it's a problem to commit violence against them. And it's absolutely horrific. And it does still exist. Not like that. Right. We weren't in a post-Civil War era, but it still exists in pockets of of America. It certainly does. And we see it more in sometimes coded language, calling someone a yes. DEI higher. The idea that you're inferior, you could not achieve this on your own. If you're of color, the only way you could achieve this is some government program that helped you. You know, you did recently uh, an interview of Vice President Harris and Governor Walls. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to get, from, from your insight, you know the left and the right are going to look at that interview through a microscope. Does that impact any way in, in the way you prepare yeah. or the way that you deal with the actual interview in real time? 
You know, it's funny, as I was preparing for the interview, one of my amazing colleagues said to me, um, you know, you have to think of this like the debate, like you're gonna get a you know what storm on your head. And I was like, yeah, I know. But I, I kind of felt like it was it was different and, and it was for lots of reasons. Mm -hmm. The stakes were certainly not as high and the consequences didn't end up the same. But um, it's, it's related to what we were just talking about, about right. the partisan media and people in their echo chambers and in their silos. And for the left, they can't understand how a journalist would ask a question to help voters who are not with them illuminate what this person would do as a leader and mm -hmm. as a leader of the free world. From the right, they can't understand why I didn't just absolutely destroy her with each question. And that's not our job. That's not my job as a, as a reporter, as an objective reporter. It is to do what I just mentioned earlier, just to get more information, especially in the situation where we are now, where Kamala Harris is a very new candidate. She didn't go through the paces. She didn't mm -hmm. go through a primary process where the voters could decide whether or not, the Democratic primary voters could decide whether or not they wanted her, as flawed as those processes are, and that's a whole different conversation. Um, and, and she has been somebody who only had her own kind of platform of ideas up until she became Joe Biden's vice president. And as all vice presidents do, they, um, they are underneath and mm -hmm. they adopt sure. the policies of the, of the presidency. So it's a long way of saying, yes, I expected it. And, um, it comes with, as, as another one of my colleagues says, it comes with being in the arena and modern day politics. It does, and you know, I wonder, like, they're like, okay, interview them, like, is Jake around? I mean, I'm off on Tuesday. <laughs> I was off, Jake, I was at the beach. Oh, you're doing, like, maybe someone else can do it, because do I really want to do this? Now, I mean, does it impact you in any way as a human being, where before the interview, Donald Trump is saying, yeah. You know, do a good job praising you, and then afterwards at his rally last week, saying that you're too nice and you're nasty. You're both. It's kind oh, of remarkable. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, I missed that. Yeah. He said oh. that. He said you were too nice to them, but you're nasty to him, oh. and that it's uh, and that he to read exactly because she's always you know always nasty, but she's so nice to the Democrats, and, and he said it's a weak interview that kind of stuff. Oh. Do you? Oh, I that. Does it? Well, look, he says so much yeah, garbage, no, it's fine. to be honest. It's fine. I mean, no, it, this is fine. what he does. I got that before, <laughs> the, the Truth Social um, post that he put up before was uh, was a long, did you see yeah, a long diatribe yes. about how I, I have a, a poten the potential for greatness? Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, Obviously, I failed. Does it matter, but does it, as a human, does it matter at all as a journalist? Do you have such a thick skin that you're like, this comes with the business? Yeah. Or does it impact you in any way? I mean, I'm a human being, right. and it's it's not pleasant. Sure, but it makes it honestly makes me more resolute in understanding the impact and the um, and the importance of what we do as journalists, and to try to tune it all out. It's hard, but I try, especially when it all comes onto your phone. Yeah, it's a different time, you know. Yeah. Like people, uh, the one good thing is that Trump says so much stuff. There's no way people can see everything and react to I mean, Even I didn't see that, and it was about me. Right. <laughs> you're telling well, me the first you time. You have to Google yourself, and you're going to no, see No, I'm good. I do not do, do that. And that's how I preserve my mental health. I do not I, do that. I think it, it's got to be important. Like, that's not, it's, there are certain people, if they criticize you, I'm not speaking for you, but that it would be fine for me, because I'm like, okay, my point in writing an op-ed or saying something political, is I have a point of view. And if you want to disagree with it, that's fine. I, I'm yeah. not here to say silence. Right. Here's my point. You want to disagree. When it's personal, like, there's no need for that. that yeah. That's the stuff. Like, well, why do that? The you know, there's a you co you moderated co moderated with Jake, the big debate that happened in June. Another debate's coming up. How much push and pull is there in, inside the in the world there of say CNN or even ABC that's going to do this about? Do we fact check or do we not fact mm -hmm. check? And what I, and that ties into the book because the partisan media there yeah. is spewing their garbage. CNN obviously they made a choice. We're not going to fact check. It, as a journalist, like when you hear Trump saying something about the election line yeah. and, and this, does your instinct go like, I, I should say something or you go, that's it, these are the rules and we're just going to do it and that's life? Um, it's, my instinct is always to say something. Right. In that arena, uh, in that situation, which is a debate where it's not just us, it's mm -hmm. not the interview that I did, 
it's him against the person who is he's challenging to be president of the United States. Historically, since Kennedy Nixon, virtually all presidential election, all presidential debates are done with the moderators facilitating and not participating. And we made the decision that we were not going to be participants in in that way in saying, okay, hold on, President Biden, just we're going to get to you in a second, but let me just say, X, Y, Z, A, B, C that you just said is not true. Go ahead, President Biden, because we felt that that was his job mm -hmm. to do, and. The way that the debate unfolded, imagine if we did all the aggr aggressive fact checking on Donald Trump. We would have been accused of doing President Biden's job for him. And by the way, we would have also had to fact check President Biden, which Donald Trump didn't do, I don't think, on a couple of things, big things, like he said, no American service man died on, on his watch, which is not true. I mean, Abbey Gate, 13 right. people were killed. So it's tough. I'm not saying it's not tough. No. It is really, really tough. Um, but it's very, a debate is very different from an interview or a town hall where you are the person who is kind of running the show and, and, and you're the only one there to challenge. No, I appreciate that explanation. It, it, makes, it makes a point, that, and I hope people watching, to see that there is a distinction. There really is intellectually yeah. here when you approach one versus the other. Because you'd be fact-checking, you'd be eating all your time. Yeah. To be honest, not debate fact-checking Donald Trump, who uh, Daniel Dale said like 30 plus yeah. lies, others yeah. have hundreds, whatever it may have been. And, and it's not just the time. I mean, time is one thing, but it's also the role that we have. Right. And um, the, the question is, whether, in a debate, whether, it, whether the opponent is going to call it out right. uh, or not. And, it, and again, it is tough because these times are not like Romney, Obama, or, yeah. you know, or others. And it's, it's difficult. The stakes are, I've never been higher. Um, last thing, but just on a personal, like when, when you were moderating that debate, did you get a sense something was wrong um, with the President Biden? I, I don't mean fit like a doctor, but like this, this is not normal. I, we saw what you saw. Oh, you did? Okay. I mean, it wasn't saw, like, okay. No, we saw what everybody saw. And uh, yeah, it wasn't what we, we did a lot of prep. That was not part of our prep process. I'll just say that. Fair enough. So last thing, I mean, this book, America's Deadly Election, if you read it, and it's a very compelling book, it's well written, and it's a dark time in American history, but there's still connective tissues to what we're living through today. Mm -hmm. um, how do we prevent getting darker? How do we prevent going... Instead of 2024 getting better, mm -hmm. sliding into 1872. That's a really tough question, and I don't I don't know the answer. All I know is that whomever said originally, and we've all you know heard versions of if you don't know your history, then you're going to uh, repeat it. Mm -hmm. That is very true, um, and I, I think that we just have to be really, really focused on the guardrails that do exist in our democracy and the system that allows for it to continue and those that don't, and just be hyper aware. And I do think after 2020 and early 2021, societally we are more uh, aware of it, but as we saw in 1876 with that contested presidential election where nobody won, it could actually be worse. The history is very important. George Orwell, there's a famous line in 1984, whoever controls the past controls the future. Mm. And the idea of, that's why this history is very important. It's an unreported on area. Uh, it was great meeting you. Again, the you book, too. America's Thanks Deadliest so Election. Much. Thank you for, for tuning in to Salon Talks. I'm Dean Obidala. Thank you for watching Salon Talks. If you had a good time, why not subscribe right over here so you can get more conversations with your favorite artists, actors, directors, writers, comedians, musicians, politicians, everybody you love and I love too. And while you're here, why not watch another video right now?